welcome back, and of course, welcome aboard to the part two of the Airfix Hawk 81A2 or the P40B. Today, in this episode, we're going to get the assembly done, get this plane ready for primer and paint. And here, we're just cleaning up the excess after removing the main wings off of the, the sprue. Now, the wings went together fairly well. Uh, the kit does have some fit issues, but the wings weren't really one of them. The join was actually pretty nice. Uh, there is a huge gap here where the ailerons connect in. They, I mean, it's a natural brake line there anyway, but this is a massive gap that should actually be filled in a little bit. I'm a serial over gluer. There's two things I do too much. I sand too much and I over glue too much. And uh, that's going to cause some problems later. Although the glue, not so much in this one, but I do over sand uh, at points later on in the build. What I'm doing here is I'm test fitting. And then I'm shaving off some areas or sanding down some areas, depending on what it needs, to try to get that wing root join as flush as possible. I really don't want to have to go in and try to fill in a big wing gap. Luckily on this one, there really wasn't too, too much of one on the wing roots. Where the big problem is, is actually in the nose section. We'll get to that a little bit later, but that's where the huge gap kind of came in. Getting the fuselage, the fuselage glued in together using the clips to hold everything nice and tight. And as we all see here with the wings, when I mate the wings to the fuselage to get the best joint possible, I'm going to have to use some rubber bands. And I'm going to use that to pull that wing tips up, which brings that joint a little bit, the wing join at the wing root, a little bit closer together. So it's not going to have to use so much filler later on. Actually, worked fairly well. And there was a little bit of a too much plastic on these wing roots. So I'm sanding them down. And again, like I said before, I'm a little bit of a serial over sander. Uh, I didn't do so much here on the wing roots, but just remembering the build as I'm recording this later, I did way too much on a couple other sections and actually made a gap where there wasn't one. So lessons learned for me anyway, and hope maybe for you, maybe you're yelling at the screen possibly already. You know, don't too much, too much sanding. But uh, lessons learned for me, a little bit at a time, a little bit, a little bit, test, a little bit, test, a little bit, test, a little bit, test. I was doing more like sand, 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 uh, sand, 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 uh, sand, 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 test. Oh, that's too much. So for the future, a uh, little bit at a time, just little tiny corrections. And I should have known better, but. You get, you know, you get into a groove with the sanding. You get into a groove and you just can't stop. Even though it's the, the one thing I hate the most, I can't stand sanding. It's just there's something about it. Like once I'm in it, I just keep going, keep going, keep going. The forward and backwards motion you're seeing there as I'm moving it back and forth is it didn't fit quite well um, from nose to tail. It fit fairly well between you know, horizontally, but wings to t nose to tail, there was a little bit of a gap, so I had to choose where I wanted that gap, and I chose to move it all the way aft that way, because the the engine cowling, the cow flaps that's going to come on later, were actually going to cover any gap that would be up on the nor on the nose side. So that's how I uh, I chose to do that, and in the end, you can't really see it. Now this nose piece where the cannons are and the where the cannon is and the machine gun I'm sorry excuse me where the two machine guns are and the uh, intake this piece here is the one that gave me the most problems with fit it fit I should say it fit fine it just left a massive gap and a step no matter how I got it in there um, I'm cleaning up the edges here and you'll see I'm going to be test fitting. And you can see that, especially towards the aft section, that massive gap there. 
that's going to have to be filled. And on the on the front, if you look at it from the front side, which is covered up by the by the prop and the spinner, which is fine. But on the front, you can really see how how it's almost warped. I don't know if it is warped. It just kind of there's something off about it, uh, and it's going to take a lot of putty later to fill that in and get it looking nice. And in the process of that, I'm just going to be obliterating any of the detail that's up there. Not using this kit as a as a uh, rescribing one. I, I'm not quite there yet. I don't feel like I'm there yet on my my skill set for rescribe. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I'm quite there yet. I'm going to probably save that for an, the next kit, maybe. Or a, another one down the line that I'm just kind of thinking ahead of what I'm planning on doing later. But um, So I'm not going to do any rescribing on this kit. I should, because I do end up losing some detail on a lot of this stuff. But um, I, I might do a little here and there, but not a full full rescribe of some of these details. And there's a lot of rivet detail, especially up here on the nose. That's just gonna it's gonna be gone. And I'm just probably not gonna be replacing it. It's just I'm gonna live with it. But that's just me. I'm just uh I'm not a rivet counter. It's kind of a derogatory term, I think, now the days nowadays, but yeah, uh, I'm not much of a rivet counter. I do it's kind of strange coming from someone who has a kind of a history take on these things and it's more interested in the history and the and the realness of it the 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 reality of it i guess i should say but i think as we talked about in the last episode you're never going to be 100 percent real it's never going to be exact ever one it's just impossible two it's it's you know a 70 second of the size in this case it's just never going to happen so it's not about being exactly real. It's not about making it look real. It's about making it look realistic. And the ick is the important part of that word. Realistic. Is it, could it have looked this way? Yes, maybe, possibly. That's more what I'm going for. And, and for me, the history portion is, again, just about learning, being about understanding, having a better appreciation for what happened and our past. You can see here on the nose, again, going back to those gaps, the um the big gap in the, the big gap in the upper section of the nose cowl, and then as I put on the, those ra that radiator scoop, those radiator intakes on the bottom, that had a large gap in there as well, which did leave a step. And then as I go and fill it, and we'll get to that when I, you know, later on filling that in. But just obliterating a lot of the detail up there. It's time to learn the ABCs of the P40, that is. You may want to get some notes because it gets complicated. This is where our naming confusion comes in because Curtis had its own naming version, the U.S. had one, and the Commonwealth countries had their own, and Curtis had different ones for different countries, too. So the original production aircraft was the Curtis H-81, the straight P-40. If these were exported, Curtis called them the H-81A specifically to France. When France was overrun by Germany, these were diverted to Britain, and they called it the Tomahawk Mark I, I guess just to be different, and uh, maybe to help confuse us 80 years later. These early model P-40s, they offered no protection for the pilot or the fuel tanks, and Britain found that they were unsuitable for combat. A single straight P-40 was modified with a rear-facing camera in the rear of the fuselage, and this was designated the P-40A. They only made one of them. So Britain, having already discovered that the P-40 was lacking in certain areas, they ordered an improved version with armor, uh, bulletproof glass, they called it armor glass at the time, and self-sealing fuel tanks. Curtis responded, and they made these self-sealing fuel tanks, but they put the rubber membranes that would seal over a bullet hole in the fuel tank external to the actual fuel tank, which wasn't adequate to actually stop the leak. It should have been internal. Curtis named these, this variant the H-81A2. And the British called it the Tomahawk Mark II. In the U.S., of course, everything's got to be different. We called it the P-40B. And Curtis called it the H-81B if it had U.S.-based equipment, specifically a U.S. radio. Once again, being unsatisfied, Britain asked for an internal rubber membrane to the fuel tanks so that they could, would actually seal. Curtis did not see this as enough of a change to warrant a change in designation, so they still called these the H-81 
A2s, but Britain did change it and they called these models the Tomahawk Mark IIb. In the US, these were called the P40C. And this model had shackles for an external fuel tank or one bomb straight underneath the center fuselage. So it's somewhere in this range, the B, the C, the Mark II, or the Mark IIb. This is where our Flying Tiger aircraft came from in this kind of batch order around this time. But before we dive into and really try to figure out which one that they had or which ones they had, we're, we're going to come back to that. Next built was the P40D model or known in the Commonwealth countries as the Kitty Hawk Mark I. Notice they went from the Tomahawk to the D model, now called the Kitty Hawk. There was less than 50 of these built total. They did remove the, the nose guns and added two fifty calibers to each wing. The original models up to this point had two fifty caliber nose guns and four rifle caliber wing mounted guns. This also had a larger Allison engine and a larger air scoop. This is where we start getting the big mouth P-40s. The P-40E may be one of the most recognizable ones. The P-40E is really kind of where the Warhawk started becoming a real fighter. The Commonwealth called this the Kitty Hawk Mark 1A and added an extra 50 cal in each wing for a total of six. All these P-40s had the Allison engine at this point, and it was, as famously known, not very well performing at high altitudes, so they tried it with a Merlin engine, and the Merlin engine P-40s were the F- and the L model, I know we're skipping a couple of letters here, but the F and the L model were powered by the Merlin engine. In the Commonwealth countries, it was known as the Kitty Hawk Mark II. Because it had a Merlin engine, there was no carburetor scoop on the top of the nose, so the whole top of the nose was smooth. The L model sometimes had a fillet on the front of the vertical stab, or a stretch fuselage was to compensate for the higher torque of the more powerful Merlin engine. However, Merlin engines were needed for a lot of airplane models at the time, so they went back to the Allison with the P-40G, which is a Allison engine P-40 just with the wings from the P-40F. Moving on to the P-40K, which is an Allison engine P-40L, also known in the Commonwealth as the Kitty Hawk Mark III. The P-40M Mike, powered by a better performing Allison engine at, at altitudes, and it also had a stretched fuselage like the L model. And finally, the P-40N was the final production model. It had the stretched rear fuselage. It has a long, if you look at them, the scene in the picture here has a lot longer rear fuselage behind the cockpit. It had improved rearward visibility. They cut down the fuselage a little bit so the pilots could see backwards a little bit better. It was known in the Commonwealth countries as the Kitty Hawk Mark IV. Many weight-saving measures and efforts were made to eliminate as much weight from the airplane as possible to give it any boost in performance. And included in that was removing 150 cal from each wing. However, after complaints, obviously, from the actual frontline units, it was added back in later. Curtis tried one more time to build the ultimate P-40 to compete with the, what was then coming out, the P-51s. Designated the XP-40Q. It was a P-40N, modified with a four-blade prop, cut-down rear fuselage, had it having a bubble top, four guns, squared wingtips and tail surfaces. It had a better engine with a two-speed super supercharger at this point, which made this the fastest P-40 of any of the models. However, all these improvements were not enough to merit production contract when it was compared with the P-51 and the P-47s, which were already in production. So it was, other than the other than the prototype models, it was never produced for combat. However, it did reach 422 miles per hour, again, making it the fastest P-40 ever produced. In the end, it was the third most produced fighter aircraft of World War II behind the P-51 and P-47. Production ended in November of 1944, with 13,738 aircraft being produced. So for an aircraft that was supposedly, as some people claim today, obsolete before it even entered the war, not only does it have one of the best records of the war, the third most produced airplane, if it wasn't, and that's not just it was cheap to make, because there's other examples of airplanes that were cheap to make that they didn't make that many of. This airplane performed, and if you listen to the veterans that actually flew it, it performed well, but it had its limitations, granted, and you had to know what you were doing. 
but it was an excellent ground attack aircraft. It was an excellent diver. In fact, it was probably one of the fastest diving airplanes, at least in the early war. Once you get into the later war, the Corsairs and were, were very fast. The, uh, the aircraft is, is, for the most part, completely assembled, and you can see those gaps very clearly now. And I'm going to use Mr. Surfacer 500 and uh, use that in these, especially on the wing root areas, fill in those gaps a little bit. And the Mr. Surfacer 500 is not really, a, it's not a putty, right? It's not going to fix any steps in this, but it is going to make those deep join lines a little bit thinner, a little bit smaller. And so it works perfectly, especially well here on the wing roots where it's not egregious and we can just brush it in there a little bit and then after it dries come back with some IPA and then just wipe it away and it just leaves that seam line filled in there's still going to be you're still going to be able to see it it's not nearly going to be as deep so it works really well for anything that should be a a um, panel line anyway but is but a little bit too deep. You can just use some Mr. Surfacer 500 to fill it in, and it comes off so nicely, and you don't have to sand it, which is the best part. Now, I am putting it in here up on the nose and uh, the front section, but because of that step, it's I'm just having to do too many. I did too many applications of it and kept constantly going back and filling it in and filling it in, filling it in. Eventually, I just, I was hoping to get away with not using putty and sanding it uh it just wasn't possible up in the front i had to i had to at some point like i said this mr Sur mr surface for 500 and you just use a cotton tip q-tip cotton bud whatever you call it uh dipped in some ipa and just rub away at it until it disappears and just leaves a little bit right there in the crevice it works really really well and no sanding, nice and clean. So one thing I did try to do up on the front is, is try drilling out the 50 cals on the nose. And I do have a small, really, really small drill, but it slipped on one of them. And instead of doing a nice, neat little hole in the front to simulate a, a you know, the gun barrel, it... It kind of cut through on the side and looked terrible. So I ended up having to cut a little bit of that down. And, and in the end, the the 50 cals up on the nose just don't look great, unfortunately. But without cutting them off completely and putting in some new pieces of plastic or, or some aftermarket gun barrels in there, I'm either going to have to live with it or, or decide to do that. And I think I'm just going to end up living with it uh, and fix them up as best I can. All right, with assembly now complete. With the exception of the, the tail fins, I'm going to get it in primer. Here I'm using a Mr. Surfacer 1500 thinned with Mr. Leveling Thinner uh, as a base primer. I normally would have liked to use this in black because I was going to attempt a black basing. I should say I am going to attempt a black basing on this uh, for the first time. Again, something I, uh, new, technique, new techniques, new things to try, new things to, to work out. On this model, and that's what I was planning on doing. But I couldn't get any Mr. Surfacer 1500 in black. So I would have preferred, so rather than doing it in two steps, I would have rather done it in one. But unfortunately, this is just the way it was. I couldn't get any Mr. Surfacer 1500 in black, so I had to use the gray, which I already had. And so I'm going to use that as a primer. And then I'm going to paint a black on top of it. We'll see that, I believe, in the next episode. I think I'm going to end this one here with the primer. And the next episode will be about paint. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Building History. And on the next episode, we'll get this thing to paint and start seeing what it's actually going to start looking like. That's always my least in favor part. Bittersweet for me. Because I am not a great painter, but that's really when it starts to look like what it's supposed to look like. So, thanks again for watching. Thanks for joining me. And hope you join me next time for part three of the P40 build.